Morning. Welcome to the well, whatever time it is you're when you're watching this um, <laughs> meeting of the Scarlet Quill Society um, here at Yeah Right or here in Portland, Oregon um, today and this month we are talking about and we'll put the link to the post in the description. Hey, look, I'm pointing. I'm I'm getting the hang of this, guys. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're talking about big mistakes. We're still talking about big mistakes, but we're talking about the kinds of issues that you may not catch until the story is finished or that you might want to catch early as an editor when a project is handed to you. And it is super, super tempting when you get that project or when you pick up your story to start editing or your novel, your essay, whatever you're looking at, it's really tempting to go sentence level first. And this is something that as a professional editor, I see a lot from clients. They're like, well, why aren't you editing my sentences? Why aren't you editing my sentences? And the answer is you have bigger problems than the Oxford comma. Um, there are structural things that appear in stories, um, and I'm going to call everything a story because even if it's creative nonfiction, you are telling a story. Um, when I was a practicing attorney, uh, people would be like, what are you doing today? I'm like, well, I'm telling stories. Um, a brief is a story. It's a story about the thing that the other guy's client did to your client or that your client didn't do to the other guy's client. Um, <clears throat> That, that you tell with the facts. So we story tell almost compulsively, right? So whether we're talking about fiction or nonfiction, anything that you're doing to communicate that has a narrative hook, I'm going to treat as storytelling for the purposes of probably this entire series, frankly, but definitely this month. So if you're writing your memoir, don't get turned off by me saying story. I, I'm not implying that you're lying about your life or that your client is lying about their life, but you are crafting that life into a story that somebody wants to read and listen to. And because of the nature of this month's topics, we're going to be talking about a lot of kind of heavy things that pop up in people's writing. So. I am content warning this video, and we're going to have a content warning in the description. Um, look at my notes over here. Uh, we are probably going to talk about uh, sexual or gendered or racialized violence, both physical and emotional. Um, there's definitely going to be gore. There's going to be a little body horror. I'm going to try to keep it down to this type of thing happens. Um, and, and very general descriptions, so I'm hoping to avoid any material that's going to be specifically triggering to people. But uh, for folks in the meeting, if y'all need to, you know, turn your video off, if you're, if we're getting into a subject that you are not sure that you're okay to engage in, if you want to walk away and come back in five minutes, I'm not going to be offended in the slightest. Um, and if you need to talk to me or make sure that you get a question about those subjects answered um, at the time and you're not sure if you're going to be able to phrase it in a way that's not going to, to perpetuate any harm, um, feel free to drop it in either in the chat in this Zoom. I've got it set up so the chats just come to me. You cannot accidentally uh, chat everybody with your question, and I will try to rephrase it in the answer and, and make it as uh, sort of, um, you know, kind. It, it, it's very hard to talk about. We don't talk enough about kindness, I think, um, both in, in writing and in editing. Um, and kindness isn't necessarily, you know, being nice. It's not avoiding tough subjects, but it is being mindful that we're engaging with tough subjects. Um, and with subjects that people have personal experiences with and that people have as personal traumas. So um, again, if anybody needs to step away, if anybody needs to ask me a question after the meeting about something that they weren't able to engage with at the time or that they are more comfortable engaging with in text rather than trying to make words go in that moment, 
Um, I know when I'm having a kind of a struggle time, uh, I lose my words. I, I do get aphasic, and, and a lot of people do, and that's not something to be worried about. Just, you know, shoot me a DM. Uh, if you're comfortable, go ahead and drop it in the Scarlet Quill Society channel. Um, the other thing that we are probably going to end up talking about, um, I'm like skimming through my notes, I'm like, oh, plot twists, death and suicide. Those are uh, things that, that people think of as, as big shocking plot twists a lot. So, um, so we are going to discuss those, but again, generally. Um, and I think, I think that's going to be it. Um, and by it, I mean we literally just talked about everything, <laughs> anything that, that, that can be content warning for. So I'm going to try to flag stuff verbally as it comes up, but um, I am really, really sorry uh, if, if anyone has a, a hard time with this. And like I said, I'm providing some other avenues that we can continue to engage with this month's topic on and make sure that everybody gets their questions answered. So, um, so as an editor, you get a project in your lap, and you're like, oh, this person uses a lot of M dashes, but also. And it's the but also that we're talking about this month, because it's not going to matter how many M dashes you take out if you're telling them that they need to restructure a character or a plot point or change all of their pacing, they are going to end up rewriting so much of that story that you might as well never have touched those M dashes. So it's a waste of your time. It's a waste of your client's time. It's a waste of your client's money. Don't do it. Just deal with the big things first. And this is, um, it's hard, right? Because you end up like reading mile high and you're like, well, it's also maybe a waste of my client's time for me to read this whole story before I start editing on that level. So, you know, you don't have to do a big, deep read but read at least in chunks because these are patterns that you're going to pick up on. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, and they're not patterns that you're going to pick up on when you're editing at the sentence level. So the first couple of things that I want to talk about are plot issues. Um, and they're spaced out a lot more in this month's post, but I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of bring them together. I think I rearranged last month's topics too. Uh, anybody else, you know, write a whole thing and then get regrets and rearrange their stuff? That's literally what we're talking about. We're editors. This is what we do. Um, so the first thing that I want to talk about is with the caveat that not, none of these things are inherently bad. <clears throat> what we're looking for is, well, it's like vitamins, right? Like you can get poisoning of most types of vitamins um, as I drink my B vitamins. Um, but, you know, you also will get horrible diseases if you don't have enough. So <clears throat> keep that in mind as we move through this, that like, I'm not saying any of these are inherently bad. And I'm also approaching this from a Western storytelling perspective, from someone who writes and edits in English as their primary language for a primarily English language audience that is steeped in Western European style storytelling. Um, so those, those are big caveats because when you look at storytelling in, <clears throat> say, uh, South and Southeast Asia, some of these things are storytelling conventions. They're not just, oh, well, you should take that out. It's a, it's a storytelling convention that your audience will be familiar with. And so if you are editing for someone who is not from a primarily Western storytelling tradition, um, uh, not from this, you know, think about who they are, 
what they're writing for, who their audience is, too. Because if they are from a different tradition, but trying to tell stories for a primarily Western European audience with that gaze in mind, maybe you do want to edit out some of the cultural artifacts that you wouldn't want to edit out if they're editing, you know, for an in-culture audience, right? Um, so with that caveat in mind, um, let's talk about info dumps because it's one of the things that especially like fantasy and spec fic and um, you know, anytime you're doing big world building, um, whether that is as big as, you know, you've created an entire world and a magic system that goes in it and a culture and here's this kingdom and here's that kingdom and they interact together and they're having a war because of these specific cultural differences or whether it's as small as somebody needs to know the family history here before they can understand why the family dynamic is happening. You're going to need to give information. <clears throat> the issue is that if you give all of the information at the same time, your audience is going to have a lot of trouble digesting and retaining it. So <clears throat> look at how you are giving information. If you have to give a chunk of information before a scene so that people understand this, is there enough room before the scene to stretch that out? Um, can you just give them what they need to know right then and reinforce it? And where later in the story, depending on the length of the story, can you touch, you know, base with that information and remind people that it exists before they have to engage with it again? Because, um, here's the classic example, you don't actually have to read the Silmarillion to understand The Hobbit. Thank God. Um, it is, I'm sorry, I know there are people who love it. I, it is like reading the begats in the Bible. Um, it's, uh, there's people who love that too. No judgment. People can love what they love. I don't love it. Um, so make sure that your information is presented in a digestible form. The other thing is that like, if you look at your story and the whole thing, you're like, okay, well, all of this information is necessary. And this is where um, what I was talking about earlier with the sentence level editing versus top level editing comes into play. You might look at the scene by scene and be like, okay, there's info, here's the scene, here's info, here's the scene. It's, it's all placed, you know, immediately before the scene. And then you step back and you're like, half of the 2,500 words of this story are info dump. Or this is a 7,000 word story and more than half of it is giving information. I don't have room to tell my story because I'm doing so much world building. Um, your story may not fit in the parameters of the submission that you're trying to hit. Um, if you can't tell it with less information and more story, Think about either letting the story take up the amount of room it needs to take up, even if that is a ridiculous Pat Rothfuss name of the wind amount of room. Um, name of the wind, by the way, is shorter than Gone with the Wind. And people keep forgetting that. They get all blown out about how long it is. It's shorter than Gone with the Wind. Um, anyway, give your story the room it needs or take some of the information out and just engage with the amount of information that you need to tell your story. Um, can you give the knowledge to a character? Can you have it come out in, in conversation between characters? Not all of your characters know everything about the world either. Now, there's also kind of this balance you have to strike because like, are you going to make this author insert or reader insert character that knows nothing about the world? And if so, how... If you do that, don't forget that that character is a thinking, feeling, reasoning being. Give them some information, yes, but they should be able to figure things out based on that information. They shouldn't have to constantly be told, like, 
Here is an orange. It is orange. We name our fruit after colors. Here are some blueberries. They are blue. We name our fruit after colors. Um, and so, like, they should be able to extrapolate. They should have so, – and it, it will help your audience not get impatient with them, right? Like, your character can, can think and reason. And this is back to last month's topic, and, and we'll be doing this again in a couple of months when we talk about building characters and building whole characters. Um, so there's a lot of ways to give information that are not an info dump that you should be taking advantage of. Now that I've info, info dumped at you, um, let's talk about a couple of pacing things that we didn't necessarily cover last time. One of them is nonstop action. Um, you have a fight scene, and then 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 a fight scene. And yeah, they're they're all like moving towards like um, the the big climax of the book that is the epic fight scene. But your readers may not be able to recognize what's epic by the time they get to that fight scene. Looking right at you, Blade Runner two. Um, <laughs> it was a beautiful movie. But it was one epic fight scene after another, um, and the the characters were fighting, and they were bleeding, and they were taking damage. And so by the time you got to a point where you were supposed to be concerned that a character was injured, you had seen that character be injured so many times that you weren't actually stressed out about it. it, it they had l accidentally lowered the stakes for the movie because by the time you get to the, the final conflict, um, as far as you're concerned, this character is immortal. You're not worried about them at all. Um, like, oh, they're bleeding, whoop. <laughs> um, and then it turns out to be very, very serious after all. And, and you were supposed to have a lot of tension. Are they gonna be able to do the thing in time before they bleed out? Didn't work. Contrast that with the old guard where you are given information that a character is absolutely definitely not immortal um, through a small non-threatening injury and then when a larger injury happens you are already primed and it's like and there was enough space in between it where this character had some moments where they dealt with it and they, they thought about it and they thought about like oh my gosh what happens if i die um so you as the, the viewer are then primed for this other piece of storytelling. You've gotten the exposition, you've gotten the information that you need to be concerned. So I kind of combined nonstop action with it goes to 11 um, there. And that's, it goes to 11 is, I don't even know what I would call it. Like it combines so many issues. Uh, it's bad pacing if you start with your, your epic conflict. And this isn't saying, you know, don't start with conflict or don't start with um, an epic battle and then dial back. Um, I mean, Empire Strikes Back is a perfectly good movie, right? Um, maybe. A lot of people like it. Um, <laughs> but it does mean that if you start at 11, you need to like give people a break. You take this like down to negative one and let them chill out for a while before you bring it back up. Um, if your hero starts with world ending powers um, in a massive global conflict and you've still got this much book left, where are you going with that? And how are you going to get there? How do you increase the stakes? How do you get your audience to connect? So Empire Strikes Back made it work by dialing back to a much lower stakes moment with the understanding that it was sandwiched between two high stakes conflicts, both of which involved the Death Star. Um, spoilers, guys, but, you know, the movies are as old as I am, and I'm pretty old, so um, I'm pretty sure the spoilers don't count. So when you take everything to 11 immediately, you're probably looking at a nonstop action problem. You're probably looking at a pacing problem. You're probably looking at a stakes problem. And so when you see this in your work, 
Um, if you're the author, be patient with your characters. Let them get there um, in their own time. Um, I, too, want to get to the world ending conflict in my book. I don't want to deal with a swampy middle um, where we all mess around and get some exposition and figure out what's what. But um, it turns out that as a reader, I don't mind reading the swampy middle. And I, you probably don't either. Um, you're like, oh, I get to spend some more time with these characters and I get to invest. Those are the points where the characters can invest. Um, I have a horrible habit of clearly only using uh, science fiction and spec fic and fantasy examples. So uh, it's who I am and what I read. <laughs> but if you're looking at, like, for example, um, oh, Mad Max, we'll, we'll take Fury Road, right? There's, it opens with a very high stakes conflict, but then there's a long stretch of time where you gain more information about who the characters are and as a viewer you start to invest in them because the conflict is like, oh my gosh, wow, this is a, a big, it's a beautiful, it's an epic movie, there's a lot of explosions, there's good music, um, and then it, it settles down and there's, you know, violence <laughs> and like, okay, we're, we're taking a breather. Now I'm watching these characters interact and you, you, that's when you start to actually care more so that when you do get back to 11, um, and I will say Fury Road is a, a movie that tends to keep it at 11 or zero. That's, there's not a lot of calibration in between. So obviously it can be done, right? It's, it was an immensely popular movie. Um, and, and Mad Max is an immensely popular series, and it does have a series of very calibrated high-stakes chases in every movie. Um, but do it mindfully, right? Like, make sure that there are breaks. Make sure that you're not asking your reader to sustain that level of emotion all the time. They're going to get tired. They're going to bounce off your book. Um, and I want to tag creative nonfiction here specifically and memoir specifically um, don't just grab all the most important dramatic moments out of your life don't just grab you know um, uh, here's your content warning for child abuse <laughs> Don't grab, I had an abusive childhood, and then uh, my boyfriend was abusive in college, and then I had this hugely epic, you know, saga of, uh, I, you know, broke my neck, and now I'm recovering. And, and if all of this happened to you, yes, it's your story to tell. Yes, um, people want to know about it, but... To avoid just writing trauma porn or inspiration porn, the, the point about the memoir that makes it interesting isn't that it happened. It's that it happened to you and you're someone that they should care about. So give them a chance to get to know you in between these big events. Don't just, you know... If you think about your life, the narrative of your life as a seafloor and the big events as places where the seafloor pokes out and makes islands, don't just describe the islands. Make sure they see some of the things that are swimming around down here. Give them a, give them a little break. Come down from 11. Um, you, there's so many memes that go around about people who compulsively turn their trauma into funny stories. Um, I'm one of them. Um, it's me, personally attacked. But but do that because that that humor, that that relaxation, that sense of taking a breath is good for your reader. Um, all right. So those are actually like for as much time as I just spent talking about that. I think that was 15 minutes. Um, those are the little mistakes 
those are really, really easy things when you see them as a pattern in a book, whether you're reading it or writing it. Um, they're easy to redistribute. It's time consuming. It's a pain in the butt. You want to try making to not make that mistake in the first place. But it is something that you can just kind of handle and get on with your life. Unlike this next section, which is about plot and characters and taking out your plot or characters uh, may affect your ability to have a story. So um, here we go. First of all, I want to talk about how much I love horror. <laughs> um, I love it. I love it as a genre. I love reading it. I'm not any good at writing it. Um, but, you know, I, I grew up reading Stephen King way too early, uh, reading all kinds of things that I had no business reading. Uh, my mother did not have a, a very strong sense of what's age appropriate. She had a can my child understand the words uh, criteria for uh, was I allowed access to a book, which in one sense is great because it means that I had a huge breadth of things available to me. On the other hand, she's handing an eight-year-old like Clan of the Cave Bearer and Vonnegut and like, oh, congratulations, you can read it, so you might as well. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot to be that kid, um, but but I love horror. And so, you know, I read Stephen King's It when I was the same age as the kids in the story, um, which is a really unique experience of that book, I think. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's a bunch of other Gen X kids who also have, have read It at that age, but it's it is definitely a different way to come to that story as far as where you are self-inserting in the horror story. Um, so as we move into plot and characters and I start talking about shock value and gore and violence and when it's appropriate and, and what you're doing, just remember that I'm clearly not denigrating those as storytelling techniques. They are all things that have a time and a place um, that I firmly believe are a valid genre and a wonderful genre and one that I, um, that I spend a lot of time with. But they also don't necessarily belong everywhere. And the thing about these sort of like, let's call them problematic slash traumatic story elements is that you need to have a good reason for putting them in your work. So try to hold that in mind as I move into this section. Um, I'm not saying don't put them in. I'm saying have a reason. Have a good justifiable reason and have a reason that's adequate. Um, and I think the, the difference between good and adequate here is uh, sometimes a reason that is good enough for you is not adequate for anyone else. Um, you may have a great reason to you for including this element, but think about whether that's adequate for someone who does not share your background, your specific traumas or lack of traumas, um, your cultural background, especially if you are not um, a member of a culture that might be affected by this. Um, and I know a lot of people have like complicated cultural identities. Uh, that is definitely a thing. Um, but, but make sure that your reasons are adequate. Uh, and it'll, it'll become clearer what I'm talking about in just a second. So the easiest, the easiest way into this topic, I think, is um, I want to back up for two seconds and talk about info dumps because 
you know the best info dump lately uh, that I've seen is at the beginning of Encanto, where um, where Maribel is singing the family madrigal. That is a huge info dump. It works really, really well. The next time you watch Encanto, go look at that. She has introduced every single member of the story. She's made it catchy. And then when you see them the next time, they are doing something that reinforces the info dump that you had at the beginning of the story. Um, okay, so speaking of Encanto, uh, is there a bad guy in Encanto? So, you know, yes and no, right? Like, Abuela is the antagonist nominally. Um, the bad guy is definitely family trauma. <laughs> um, but that piece of storytelling, think about how much it does not take away from the movie or the story to not have a bad guy, evilly evil bad guy, worst guy ever. Let's just take this guy and make uh, them a, a, they're a racist, they're a rapist, they're, you know, and, and that character is in Encanto. It's, you know, that's how you get driven out of the village and you come settle the valley, but that's not the antagonist. They're not there in. That's a backdrop. And so it doesn't have to be nuanced or interesting because, like, essentially it's this story that the family has told themselves. Um, it's also a very, very real, very violent thing that really, really happened and is happening still, and I want to be very clear about that, that I'm not you know, relegating this to, oh, it's super evil, so it can only happen in a story as a story that people... No, there is terrible things happening in the world right now, every day, and as writers, we do engage with them. I'm not saying don't engage with them. What I am saying is that if you're going to put them in your story... Do it mindfully. Um, so racism. Sure, there are going to be some antagonists in your book who are racist. Um, especially if you are a white writer um, writing in the U.S. or Canada, there are going to be some protagonists in your book that are racist too, and you may not notice. That is definitely a thing that happens. Um, so this is racist. Not only is it to to put it in your story, you have to repeat it, but it's also not actually adequate to establish that your bad guy is bad. <laughs> so think about that. Um, in the same way, homophobia or transphobia, you don't have to make those people be the good guys. Um, but that's not enough to establish that your bad guy is bad. You still have to do the work because people who have experienced racism or homophobia or transphobia in their lives have also experienced it from their friends and from people that they thought were their friends and from people that they work with and from people who are not. So from the outside looking in, it seems like it's very, very easy to say, like, only bad people would X, but people who live against that backdrop of, of gendered or sexualized or racialized aggression operate in a much more nuanced way within it. Um, so think about that. Think about doing work to establish that your bad guy is bad that goes beyond them dropping an N-bomb because that's you, right? You are writing that word. And your readers are experiencing that word. And that's a complicated one because there are contexts in which there is, you know, reclamation of the word, but especially 
if you do not experience that as racialized violence against you, think about it, right? Like, think about whether that's something that you want to say. Because there's definitely, like, as editors, we read stories, and sometimes what we end up with is wondering how long this person has been waiting to drop as many end moms as they want. Um, or I read, I read an awful lot of uh, Napoleonic war fiction. That's my problematic fave. Uh, I'm Rowan, and I named my cat after Horatio Hornblower. Um, <laughs> so there are a lot of writers writing in that genre who um, very clearly have just been hanging out waiting to use a racial slur, and they're like, I can say frog. I can say frog because frog is about white people. And it's just, it's kind of icky, honestly. Um, and you are going to have people bounce off your books. And, you know, think about whether they're readers you want to keep or readers you want to have, and think about how they're reviewing you to their friends. Um, and on Goodreads and Amazon and other places that you would like to have positive reviews. Sexual assault. Um, I'm going to wind fridging into sexual assault here. Um, there is an entire category of stories, and it is a huge trope. Uh, you have gendered violence against a character, and, and while fridging does not have to be gendered violence, it often is. It most often is. Um, and this violence has nothing to do with your story. It could be replaced by a banana, right? Like it, it, it fails the banana test. Um, it, uh, people, people fight me on this one all the time. They're like, no, 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 it, it has everything to do with my story. It's why my heroine leaves her home. I'm like, you literally couldn't think of another reason for someone to leave home at the age of 18. You could not think of another reason, any other reason than, you know, an entire army rode in and murdered her family and, and raped her. You, you couldn't think of any other reasons in the history of reasons. Um, or, oh, it has everything to do with my plot because it's why my hero is fighting the bad guy. I'm like, is your bad guy bad? Would your hero not have done anything about that? Your hero would have just been like, oh, cool, cool. You are like the big evil guy, but I was going to leave it alone until it got personal. And it got personal by totally murdering someone that I cared about, which completely reduces this entire other character to an object. Anything that that character could have been as a person no longer matters. They exist only in relation to. Um, and it's like reading the anti-sexual violence commercials um, or memes that were going around that say, like, you know, she's somebody's sister, she's somebody's daughter, she's somebody's mother. And, and the There I Fixed It version where it says she's somebody. All of this using violence against one character to motivate another character who is unaffected by the violence, except they are suddenly motivated to engage with your plot. Um, not only are you repeating all of these violent tropes, you are telling any of your readers that have experienced that violence or that trauma in their life that the highest and best use of their entire existence is the way that it affects some other person. And that is a whole nother type of re-traumatizing. Um, you're gonna lose people. And honestly, it's lazy. It's, I, I try to use judgmental words about writing so little that this series has been kind of like both fun and 
a little off-putting to me because I just like, oh, I don't really want to say lazy or bad or, or whatever, but it is. It's depending on the weight of storytelling tradition to carry your point for you. It is leaning into, okay, well, this has been considered culturally for us an adequate motivation through a century of movies, through centuries of writing. Um, so I can use it too. And the problem is that that tradition is, you know, it's racist, it's sexist, it's homophobic, it's, it's colonial, it's it's violent. It's a violent tradition. And if you're going to invoke it, all you're doing is, is photocopying a violent tradition. It's nothing of you. It's not any of the intelligence that you can be bringing to your writing. Um, feel free to copy this rant and send it to an author if you're editing a book and they've done this. Um, you know, it's, it's nothing of – you are capable of writing a character that can want to do good without harming someone else to get them to do that. Genuinely believe that everyone is capable of that. Um, so anytime you have a character undertake a problematic action, they should have a reason for it beyond this is a bad person and they do bad things, LOL, LOL, I'm an after school special or a lifetime movie. Um, my house ghost is chattering. We have 400 reminders right now, guys. I'm so sorry. I have two sick dogs in the house, and they are on an aggressive pill schedule. <laughs> we have, like, it looks like an old folks home in here. Like, we have, like, the, all of the different pill boxes. Um, it's great. I love it. I love my dogs. Um, <laughs> so, anyway, so characters, bad, bad, bad. Um, there's a discussion that we had in the Yeah Right Coffee House um, end of March, so it's the 10th, a couple weeks ago. We had a discussion about villains and bad guys, and somebody, I can't think who, um, said something really, really smart, which is that um, the best bad guys are people who can plausibly think that they are good guys. If your bad guy can't consider themselves the good guy or the hero of their own story, you probably haven't written a whole character. You're just relying on um, you're relying on your readers hating their actions, which you know the readers are going to hate their actions. I mean, look, this is, here's a racist rapist. Um, no, I'm not going to like this character, but that's not enough to show me why they're the bad guy in this story because wow there are a lot of racist rapists in the world you guys um and most of them think that they are the hero of the story so do the work uh, make the whole character and again when we're in creative nonfiction, yes this stuff happens um and when you're writing horror um yes this stuff happens and, and you do bring it out. And that is something that's horrible. But if you look at something like Get Out as opposed to uh, a more white gazy horror film, think about like the level of horror and what is used to show that horror. Like you're looking at the characters in Get Out and some of them are just, you know, they're, they're expecting some racism. That's not enough to make somebody a bad guy. Um, so that's that's a really interesting way to look at it. Um, the other one is there's a Batman fan theory that's been going around for ages. Let my nerd flag fly. Um, it's called Very Bad Day Theory. And while the Marvel Universe villains all have this, like, whole backstory about how, like, oh, they were always bad or they were trained to be bad or, you know, you have um, – Oh, Mystique, or you have Magneto, who went through a series of horrific events in his lifetime um, and came out of it radicalized in an unhealthy way, or you have Killmonger. Um, in the DC universe, all, pretty much all of the bad guys that Batman fights, 
just had one really bad day. Harvey Dent had a really bad day. Uh, Victor Freeze, uh, uh, his wife died. Um, Poison Ivy, Harley Quinn. It, there's a one really bad day. And that's what makes them interesting, right? Is that it could be anybody until that really bad day happens and then you find out suddenly they're a villain. So some of the villains that people engage with the best are the ones that they can see themselves in, right? The the idea that you can be like one step away from becoming a villain is a very, very effective um, method to use, certainly in, in horror, um, but also just, just in writing. Um, let's see. I listed a whole bunch of character building shortcuts that you should take the long way around in the post, and I'm not necessarily going to go back into all of them here because we do have a limited amount of time in the meeting, but just think about what tropes you're invoking, and if you're not familiar with tropes, especially if you're writing in a genre that you don't usually write in, um, have somebody who reads extensively in that genre um, talk to you about those tropes and which ones you've invoked, and what you've invoked without meaning to, and what weight those tropes carry. And as an editor, this is why sometimes you can struggle um, coming into a genre that you don't usually edit in. So if you are an editor and you're about to do this and you're not sure that you can identify tropes in that genre, Take another editor out for a cup of coffee. You know, find a way to compensate them for their time, trade them some work. Um, but but talk about what are the big common themes in that new genre that you're working in. Um, what mistakes do people commonly make? You're not the only editor in the world. You're not working in a vacuum. You have friends, acquaintances. Um, you found this video you have access to resources that you can ask and you should ask them. Um, and similarly, you know, be prepared to be asked, like, hey, you know, I'm editing this sci-fi story and I haven't done that in a while. Um, I had an editor friend come to me for help on a horror story a while ago. Um, they had been asked for a sensitivity read on the story and they were competent to do that but they weren't necessarily competent to address like what horror tropes might have been evoked um, because that's not really a genre that they read for pleasure or a genre that they, they edit frequently in. And so, um, you know, we worked together, we talked about it, and, and it's fine. Their client got some great work. Um, so let's see. What are we down to? Oh, right. Plot. <laughs> I love plot. Editing a plot that someone has messed up, uh, it, it can wreck the whole story. Um, it genuinely can. And if you've never had to tell an author your plot makes no sense or this doesn't go anywhere or um, I love your characters but that's all that there is here, uh, good job, but you're going to do it eventually. <laughs> and it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt them. And it's just exhausting, right? Like, it's so exhausting. Um, let's start with the one that might be salvageable, the plot twist that doesn't. Um, because we are all familiar with a lot of of writing tropes and, and this and that. Um, wow, how do I do this without spoilers? We all know that Soylent Green is people, right? So anyone who writes something that is similar to a story in Soylent Green, they're coming to readers with an expectation that Soylent Green will be people. That's not really a plot twist anymore. Like, oh no, the government is grinding up people. Like, 
yeah, of course they are. That's that's what that story was always going to be, isn't it? So if you're expecting like a big shock, if you're expecting that to land with a bunch of impact, it's not going to. Um, the other twist that everyone always sees coming is of what uh, what gamers call rocks fall, everyone dies. Um, you've written yourself into a corner. There's there's terrible things happening. The plane crashes. Rocks fall, everyone dies. Um, it happens to everyone. I mean, it's the plot twist in Sixth Sense. Rocks fall, everyone dies, except they do it, you know, before the story starts. So when you are, it, and it's always tempting, right? Like we spend a lot of time telling stories to each other. Everybody's got a couple of stories about themselves that they tell at a cocktail party or whatever we do instead of cocktail parties um, while we don't, you know, want to infect each other with horrible deadly diseases. Um, I, I, I tell, oh, I tell a story about my dad and the opossum a lot. Um, Christine's laughing because she's heard the story about my dad and the opossum more than once. Um, it's a good story. I'm not going to tell it here. It's a long story. But um, but there is, you know, there's there's no plot twist at the end of the opossum story. But but we do all want to like land that punchline, right? You wanna you wanna wrap up, especially a brief story with some sort of like boom, and then that's going to stay with your readers. And um, if you're Poe, you write, you know, nevermore, or and then the Red Death held sway over all. For the love of God, Montresor. Uh, you know, <laughs> you. I totally butchered that pronunciation. Let's pretend I didn't and move on with our lives. Um, you want to end with that, that big thing. But remember, in Poe, none of those were actually plot twists, were they? Um, and the thing that makes them work is that there is this heavy weight of inevitability to them so that when the, the bad thing finally happens, it's almost cathartic. You're like, oh, okay, all right, rocks fell, everyone died, that that happened. Um, it's a... Uh, you can get a lot of different kinds of emotional relief out of the end of the story. So even if you are writing horror, even if you are writing gore, even if rocks are about to fall, um, you don't necessarily have to go for the oh! ending. You can go for the oh ending, right? <laughs> um, if you are depending on something gory or disgusting or deadly or violent, happening at the end of your story to be a twist, it's probably not a twist. Um, the good news is you can salvage that, right? Like you can salvage that very, very easily. Uh, you can tack another ending onto the story, looking at you, Charles Dickens, Great Expectations still wasn't any good though. Um, you can make that plot twist not be a twist. You can change the pacing a little bit so that it becomes this you know, running through molasses kind of story um, instead of surprise. Um, what's a good plot twist story? The monster at the end of this book is a good plot twist story. And it's, it's a lot of people's sort of first experience with a plot twist story. And for people who don't know the monster at the end of this book, uh, we're all adults and I hope I'm not spoiling anything for you, but... It's a Sesame Street book, and it's narrated by this um, Muppet named Grover, who, uh, you know, obviously, like, he's a Muppet, and he's like, oh, there's a monster at the end of this book. You have to stop turning the pages. You have to stop turning the pages. And so, but you're reading the book, so you become sort of a participant in this story because you can't really stop turning the pages, and on every page Grover's warnings kind of escalate and escalate and like no there's a horrible horrible monster at the end of this book and it's hairy and it's scary and and he, and finally get down to the last page like and I think he's like drawn like trying to hold the page shut 
And he's like, no, I'm warning you, don't turn this page. There's a monster behind it. And you turn the page, and of course the monster is Grover, right? And but you've had this whole buildup, and it doesn't feel like a letdown. You're like, oh, you are the monster at the end of this book. Good for you. Um, like a joke has as much payoff as, and the monster at the end of this book was, and then you turn the page, and there's just blood everywhere. Right? Um, you could do that so many ways visually, though, because the trope is so well known now that it actually would be a twist if the monster at the end of the book was horrible. So we've now like come out the other side of that trope and, and completely in a horseshoe, right? Um, so I guess this, this drags us through, you know, plot twists and then plot twists that are just gore and then shock value. If you're putting material that can be re-traumatizing for your readers uh, in your book, it should move your story forward. It should always move your story forward, but especially that kind of material. Um, it should move your story forward, and you shouldn't necessarily treat it lightly. I'm going to drag Stephen King into this, because for all the problems that Stephen King has, He's an immensely popular writer for a reason. And one of his books um, is called The Dark Half. And it is about a writer whose pen name comes to life and tries to take over his life. Um, it, violently, obviously, it's Stephen King. There's a lot of gore. There's, you know, mess everywhere. Um, and you get to the end of the book, and because it's a Stephen King book, the good guys win. That's not a spoiler. I guarantee you that's not a spoiler for any Stephen King book. The good guys win. Um, but you encounter the characters again later in another book. And by the time you bump into them again as kind of background characters for this other story, the actual traumas that they experienced over the course of the dark half have ended the protagonist's marriage, and the protagonist now has, like, he's got a, a drinking problem because he's tried to self-medicate, and it's handled pretty darn well. But, like, it's very clear that it wasn't just, like, there was gore, this happened to me, I got over it. There is a ripple effect from that trauma, and because of that, it makes it more horrible because it makes it feel more like it's happening to real people. In the same way that blood is handled very differently in Army of Darkness versus The Village. The Village? The M. Night Shyamalan uh, vehicle where the color red is like super re-traumatizing. It has like Joaquin Phoenix in it, I think. Um, and in Army of Darkness, there's, there's blood everywhere. It is spurting. It is spraying. It's all over everyone all the time. Our our protagonist is rolling through life with a, a you know chainsaw for an arm. Um, in the village, you see blood once in the entire movie, but the whole movie is about that moment. So. Where is it more shocking? It's not actually shocking in Army of Darkness that there's blood. Um, Army of Darkness is a comedy. Um, if you do not feel that Army of Darkness is a comedy, uh, first of all, you're wrong. Um, <laughs> and not all comedy is something that everybody wants to engage with. I don't engage with a lot of comedy, but um, uh, it is a comedy. It's just a very gory comedy. So clearly just putting gore and violence into your story is not enough to make it horror. You have to actually reach in and go, go a little deeper. There's definitely, there's a place for the slasher flick. There's a place for the story. There's a place for, I know what you did last summer and the, you know, the call is coming from inside the house. Um, but, uh, but it's not every story. So 
you know, where where is this moving the plot along and where is it background piece? And do you need it as a background piece? Is it doing anything for your story? Is it doing anything for your readers? Is it just doing things to your readers? Um, the thing is, and, and this is another thing that you're going to end up telling people a lot as an editor, especially if you work with emerging writers, um, Gore isn't shocking. It's it's not. Um, as an editor, you will get so tired of gore. You will get so tired of reading story after story after story um, with a dramatic suicide in it. You will get so tired of um, homophobic violence. You will get so tired of reading the coming out story that you will just be like thrilled when you see a story where there's just some people who are just booping along un unremarkably gay and nobody's mean to them for five minutes. That's, that is shocking. <laughs> um, shocking is when you look at all of the tropes for a story that could be in there and you reject at least one of them. That's going to be more surprising to your editors. That's going to be more surprising to the readers. Um, so that's how you put in a twist. You lean into a trope right up until you don't, um, right until you flip it on its head. And it's entirely possible for one of these plot twist stories that doesn't really bend to get a plot twist written into it. Just like encourage your writer to think about what might actually be a twist instead of something that's kind of expected, frankly. Um, saw that coming, you know? Um, that is just about it for what I wanted to cover. Um, I think I've got, you know, it's the end of the world again, um, and, and horror, and again, you know, creative nonfiction. Terrible things happen. Um, terrible things happen, and there is value in telling people about them, um, especially, you know, you can do it persuasively, um, Fridging is a trope because other people's trauma can be motivating for us. Um, a lot of people who don't necessarily um, consider themselves activists uh, will step into the arena and take action to prevent additional traumatizing events from happening if they can find a narrative that they connect to that suddenly makes it click for them, like nobody should have to go through this. Um, so obviously, like, you know, don't, don't take anything I've said this month to say these things shouldn't be in a story ever. They should be. They should just be in there mindfully. And especially, again, if you're editing emerging writers, um, there is a level of mindfulness that you can encourage people to bring to it. Um, if they are genuinely bound and determined to write about these re-traumatizing things, encourage them to engage with material and do research. Um, pro tip, a lot of them won't, and it will make the story stop happening, and it will stop happening to you, which is also kind of great. Um, but encourage them to do the research, and, and the people that do do the research, they come up with, like, great stories because they suddenly have the actual knowledge of, of what happens. Um, encourage them to go through a sensitivity reading process. Encourage them to um, read similar narratives to see what is actually realistic for a traumatizing event of the nature of the one that they want to put in. And then together you can help make the decision of whether this traumatizing event would actually take over the characters' lives to the point where you can't tell the story because the trauma is happening, you know? So those are those are all things. I have now talked for a solid hour, go me, um, and I still have my voice. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions? Did I not get to anything while we were talking? Anybody? All right, um, then I am going to wrap up this very, very long ramble and I hope the couple of folks who I thought were joining us this week get a chance to, you know, talk to me in the Discord. Uh, 
all of my contact information is available. It's everywhere. <laughs> um, send us an email on the website using contact form. Uh, there's I don't know. I, I just feel really strongly about this month's topic, and I want to make sure that everybody gets their questions answered. So, um, you know, good luck. Happy writing. Good luck editing. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to read the post yet, we'll link it in the description. And there are in that post some tips for how to bring these issues up to writers as an editor, which um, hopefully will help you retain your diplomacy while uh, getting the stories to a place where they are strong and publishable and the stories that the author wants to tell.